I see the laundry's on. Yeah, it's New Year's Eve and I'm doing my washing. You didn't so you? then, Nakius, um, from last year, what was your favourite laundry moment? <laughs> my favourite laundry moment was queuing sound because, trust me, I needed to do the laundry after that one. <laughs> <laughs> Does that count as your worst laundry moment as well? Or did that come putting the stuff in the washing machine afterwards? <laughs> <laughs> I needed that laundry, I'll tell you now. <laughs> no, uh my most memorable i loved um the anchorage um near um the atlantic crossing it was um we saw some friends there you know fellow boaties and it's nice to meet up with people and it place just looks so beautiful and i also loved um uh, canna i thought that's a great place um canna was fantastic i'd love to go back there I never heard of the place. When it comes to the small isles, you're always thinking rum, egg and muck. Never heard of Canna, but I have to say, for me, it's definitely the jewel of those small isles. We haven't done egg yet, be fair. No, we didn't do egg, but I'm just sort of saying, of the ones that I did see, that was... We'll beautiful. go back in a really hot summer when it'll be a boiled egg. <laughs> well, you never know what we're going to do next summer, but... Uh, or at least... We might visit it, but like Bev said, um, I'd like to go round Ireland. That's my thing. But um, we have got a, a great way to celebrate tonight. Good old champers <laughs> uh, left by uh, one of our viewers. And I have to say, of a, of a way to celebrate, what more could you ask for? And what fun, thankful to all our subscribers and viewers. So, Beverly, it's a new season. And a new year. And a new update for the chart plotter. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'm just applying the updates to the chart plotter so the software is fully up to date with all the latest uh, bits and bobs applied. And I'm just having a quick look at our trip calculator and it says that last year's cruise from when we left Carrick in April. It was April, yeah. To now was 1,874 nautical miles. So Beverly, in that 1,700 and whatever miles, what was your most memorable? I think the giant dolphin display just outside Castle Bay. That was beautiful, it was, wasn't it? Yep, that was really, really good. That was, that was memorable. Fairhead was pretty memorable for the wrong reasons. Yeah, okay, yeah. and what was your worst memory? Being able to see Morton's chippy and smell it whilst it came round fair ahead. I mean, I couldn't actually get there because the tide pushed us back. <laughs> <laughs> the smell of it was driving me mad. Yeah. <laughs> I was looking forward to bacon for breakfast. <laughs> and it didn't happen. So, Beverly, um, what, was, uh, what would you like to do for the new upcoming season? Um, I think for the new upcoming season... Do it. Go around Ireland this year. We had a plan for last year and we didn't get to do it. So it'd be nice to finish that task before we start any other ones, like going back up to the Hebrides and St Kilda and places like that. It would be nice just to go around the island and see all the places we've bought all the charts for and all the pilotage for. It'd be nice to use it. It would, wouldn't it? And it'd be nice to see the places because they're spectacular. Well... Welcome to 2022, by the time you see this. <laughs> and um, we were just... Um getting rid of the old and one of the old things that we're getting rid of is our small craft almanac for 2021. Yeah we got this in preference to the, the big almanac, the giant reeds um, which we have downstairs. Um, principally because it's half the price, we're mean that way. Um, and this has actually worked out very very well. The bulk of this is mostly tidal information but it also has some very nice tidal diagrams which is good and it it's got other information in there which we did look at um, but in terms of tides and things it worked very well and I think we were quite pleased with this so we're going to get another one of these yeah but the um, good thing about this is uh, it leads us very well onto our talk of the day which is tides right there are three types of tides that I think we need to worry about Right. Um, there is the ocean tidal things. Um, these are known as amphidromes. Great word. Whoa. And um, you can find lots of information on Wikipedia on them and such like. And they're caused by movements of the water out in the oceans, which is principally caused by the moon um, and its gravitational effects in the sun. 
These amphidromes, as they're called, um, are caused by the moon and sun causing the water to move and the Earth's rotation causes them to twist as they, as they move. Uh, but they need a fair amount of movement north or south. So if you're in an enclosed sea like the Baltic or the Mediterranean or even the Caribbean, uh, you don't can tend to suffer from these and therefore you get very, very little tidal movement. So if you're in one of those areas, the Med or the Caribbean or the Baltic, um, thank you for watching and we'll see you in next week's episode. However, <laughs> if you're in um, <laughs> the dark red areas, <laughs> you might want to carry on to yeah. the next bit, um, which is to head toward the moon. I do want to bring in the earth, don't forget. Okay, go on then. I, I, I know you can't resist. I can't resist. And it changes the shape of the water. You... The more professional presentation will be along in a moment. Yeah. <laughs> the Blue Peter Channel is in full swing. Absolutely. To look like an oof. <laughs> I just said that. <laughs> the world is not an oof. You're butching this, right, okay. <laughs> what she's trying to say here is that tide force, difference in tidal force uh, caused by the moon causes the water to be pulled toward the moon. Yay! Right, so this means that there is a bulge of the water in the direction of the moon. Correct. And at the sides of the earth where there is no bulge, the water yeah. appears to be lower. So as the earth rotates round through these tidal bulges, yes. we get an area where there is more water than, than we would expect. And then six hours later, we get an area where there is less water than you would expect. Yes. And then as you go round to the side opposite the moon, there is another bulge around there, which people seem to think is to do with the fact that it's further away from the moon and therefore has less gravity. It's got nothing to do with that. The fact is, it's all to do with tidal force and vector differences. So as the moon pulls the water up, it also pulls the planet toward the moon a bit. But the water which is further away isn't getting pulled as much by the moon. So the whole planet moves away from the water, leaving a bulge on that side. And the water on the side of the moon gets pulled even more, making a bulge on this side. And the Earth moves slightly toward the moon as well. Mm -hmm. And that's what creates the tides. So it's got nothing to do with eggs. <laughs> Now, a fact about water which is not often appreciated is the fact it is incompressible. You cannot compress water. And this leads to a rather horrible realisation that if there's a bump in the seabed 200 metres down and water has to be lifted to get over that bump, then up on the surface 200 metres further up, the water is going to lift up there too. Now it'll spread out a bit, but that's not the point. The point is, if there's a big enough obstruction on the seabed, no matter how deep down it is, you'll feel the, sur you'll feel the effect of that on the surface. Yeah. Now, what that means to us is if you are in an area where the water is being pushed towards and it's being pushed up, then you will, you will on the surface get overflows, riptides and yes, an increase in tide. As all that water gets pushed up, um, it will spread out a bit, but the water on the surface is going to be very disturbed. Yes. Yeah, so if water is flowing from a... Uh, a shallow area to a deeper area, it's less of a problem for you. Yes, if it's going down, if it's flowing from the shallow to the deep. And this explains why areas like Biscay are so dangerous. Yes. Because the sea floor, uh, the ocean floor is like 2,000 metres down and the continental shelf is like 200 metres down. So that water's got to come up to nearly two kilometres. Mm. And it's going to do something when it gets to the top. And it's got... It's going to be high big massive waves it's going to be riptides but it also applies around local geography here like a headland generally speaking the land around a headland is a bit higher than the seabed underneath mm. it so as water comes around the headland it will be lifted up and that means it's going to be disturbed as it comes around the headland yeah no two ways about it it's going to be like that yeah so generally it's one of the reasons why headlands are have more disturbed water around them now the other thing about headlands is um, you can also have different tides working in two different ways. So for instance, um, what might happen is say the water is coming down around an island. Well, maybe the Isle of Man's a good example. It is a reasonable island example. Because you've got water coming southward in the Irish Sea Tide and you've got water coming westward and out of Liverpool Bay. 
Yes. And the island sits in the middle. And it sits in the middle. So you've got two different tides and you've got this land in between. So what that basically means is that when they um, clash into each other... You get chicken rock. You do get chicken rock, but yeah. you basically, you're going to get a lot of disturbances. And even when <laughs> it is an absolutely calm, calm day, you... In these areas, you will always have some riptides, overfalls, and you can see the water being pushed up mm -hmm. because of the land underneath. Mm -hmm. um, so, and what, then... so what does all this mean for you? Mm. Well, what it means is if you're going somewhere, take a look at the seabed. Yes. Use your charts to look at the seabed. And where you see large uplifts in the seabed, um, you can be fairly sure you're going to disturb water on the surface. Mm and um, if the tide is running strongly in an area and there's a lot of lumpiness in the seabed then you're going to have a lot of lumpiness up on the surface mm. no, no matter how deep it is if for instance if you have the uh, full moon or a new moon then you're going to be on a spring tide and the spring tide always lags the new moon or the full moon by maybe a day two days at the most but as soon as you have that full moon, you will have the spring tide just after it. Yeah, so if you've lost your tidal tables, that's a quick rule of thumb. Um, equally, if you're on the quarter moon, um, then you're going to be in the neap tides. And that just gives you a general rule of thumb as to what the tides are going to be, depending on the phase of the moon. Uh, another thing about tidal streams is you can generally spot where they're going to be and where they're going to be trouble. Um, look at parts of the coastline. If the coast has been worn smooth by tidal streams, it'll show up. I mean, the top of the Isle of Man is very, very pointed and lovely and smooth. Mm. Just uh, like... Um, Biscay. Biscay is very smooth. Lovely smooth. Cardigan Bis Bay. Cardigan Bay is another one. Really smooth. In fact, um, most of the... Yeah, the east coast of Ireland is very smooth. That means you're going to have a huge amount of tide in that area. Mm -hmm. uh, because the tide is what's smoothed that land it's out. It's a strong tide. It is a strong tide and it's smoothed it. Yeah. So even when you're going there, um, if you're going to an area where the, the land around you is smooth, uh, that probably also means there's no sand. Hmm. So not very much places to anchor. It'll probably be rocky because the tide has swept all the sand and mud away. Mm. So yeah, anchoring might be difficult in a place like that. And you know that also explains a lot of the Irish Sea. It's deep. Yep. Around the coast, there's not much in the way of anchorages. Nope. And um, the coasts are nicely smoothed off. You know, all great warning signs, and all caused by the fact that the Atlantic tides get funneled into St George's Channel and then just charge up the Irish Sea. Yep. The tidal flows, um, basically, when you've got anything that funnels water. Okay, one of the areas that really brings this out is uh, at the bottom of the Firth of Clyde. And you do mean at the bottom, as in the bottom of the sea? I do mean the bottom of the sea. But if you look at the charts, um, you can basically see a con contour line, mm. and that is being caused by again the the water um, ch um carving out carving out it could be the other way around it could be that because that contour exists on the seabed that constrains the tide to run in that pattern yeah but in whatever case the tidal pattern on the surface follows the seabed it does which is like 150 <laughs> meters further down yeah so the the <laughs> You basically have on the tides, you have this contour on the tides and you see it in the seabed. Mm. Um, one, one has caused the other, whichever way round it was. Yeah. So that's that. Um, anything else you want to bring into um, this tide talk? No, except the fact that it's getting colder and I want my coffee. That seems like a fair enough <laughs> time to stop. <laughs> simplify the explanation by only considering the effects of the moon. 
the sun's influence is about one third that of the moon. If there was no moon, the oceans would be a uniform depth around the Earth. The presence of the moon creates a gravitational force, and the closer something is to the moon, the stronger the gravitational force that thing will experience. So water nearest the moon experiences a stronger force than water further away from the moon. We can show this on our diagram by the length of the arrows. These forces are called gravitational tides. Note that the Earth also experiences a gravitational tide in the direction towards the moon. The force moving the Earth is less than the pull on the water nearest the moon, but stronger than the force felt by the water furthest from the moon. These forces have a strength and a direction, so we can treat them as vectors. Since the Earth is our principal reference frame from which we make all our measurements, we can subtract its vector from all the other forces involved. This means that the resultant forces on the water relative to those experienced by the Earth are a pull towards the moon on one side and a pull away from the moon on the other. This is what causes the two high tides each day.